I'm Valerie Hannan. I'm from the Innovation Unit in London. Um, I was the lead author and team leader of the group from the Innovation Unit, which was commissioned by Qatar Foundation to write this year's wise book, which we entitled Learning a Living. Um, I'd like to introduce, first of all, my colleague panel members. First of all, on my right is Reza. Um, many of you will know as the social innovator photographer who we were very privileged to work with us and actually is the only person who visited nearly, but not quite all, the projects that we've profiled. Um, and I'm going to explain in a minute, we profiled 15 projects across the world and Reza was the person who visited most, doing 14 of them in something like five months. Um, on my further right, we have uh, Merve Janssen, who is Director of Learning Solutions at Omnia in Finland, a large technical training organisation, vocational education training organisation. And Mrs. Faria Al Safak, who is from Kuwait, who runs a non government organisation for young people in Kuwait. Um, and there's a very particular reason why we wanted her to be part of the panel today, which is connected with the argument which we are going to run with you. Um, this book, which, as you will see if you take a look, is a very beautiful book, thanks to Reza. Um, but I've already, <laughs> I've already said that anyone who calls it a coffee table book, I'm about to give them sort of a left hook, because it's not a coffee table book. Within it, we don't only profile 15 utterly inspirational pro projects, um, though they are inspirational. It's not just a collection of projects, it is an argument. Within the book, we make an argument about the status, the nature of training for work, or uh, forgive me, not training for work, learning for work, which we think has implications for learning in general uh, and which could serve to be an engine for change in learning, which is what we in the Innovation Unit believe is fundamentally required. So um, without further ado, and as we've lost a little time already, I'm going to set out that argument for you, um, utilising uh, Razor's most beautiful images. My colleague uh, Mervi is going to time me because I'm very determined not to transgress on, on my colleague's uh, period of time. After I've presented the arguments in the book and give you a kind of an overview of all the projects, and by the way, some of the project holders, as it were, are here in the room with us, so very eminent ones. So fascinating, we're delighted to have you with us. Uh, and I, I won't name them all, that would be invidious, but many of them you will recognise from their faces because you'll see them photographed. So please do feel free to talk to them later. Um, so what I'd like to do is give you an overview of those projects, but particularly lead you to the arguments and the conclusions which we framed in the collection of the data for this book. So, um, maybe actually I will turn back to that. Note the title. This is about radical innovation in education for work. So we were not trying to do a McKinsey-style survey. We were not trying to do a survey of best practices. We were looking at radical innovation. Innovation in this space, which has the capacity to change the practice worldwide. And in that, we... Um, sort of ad adopted what in our terms would be a fairly standard methodology. We surveyed something like 100 programmes, we shortlisted around 50, and then we filtered down even further to the final 15, which we visited and spent three or four days with usually, um, talking to staff, talking to project holders, talking to learners. And out of those, we stood back and asked ourselves, what is it that we have got here in terms of a picture of what is changing this landscape about radical innovation for education in work. And to answer that question, I don't know what your methodology would be, but ours was quite simply to ask us, first of all, what's happening to the world of work? What's happening to workforces and what do they need? And therefore, how should learning be organised to meet those needs? What we didn't want to do was a standard text on vocational education and training. Frankly, the, as, as if, if you went to the, um, the debate earlier today in, in the large auditorium about education for training or, or education for work, many people there remarked that this is often seen as the second class, the option for losers. And the option for losers is what it must not remain. So what we are looking at here is a picture where the world of work has changed beyond all recognition. The needs of workforces, that is to say all citizens actually, have changed too, but learning hasn't changed in terms of its organisation or its design to meet those needs. Our projects have, and we want to pick up some of the lessons from them, from their pedagogy, from their approach to curriculum, from their approach to assessment, and ask ourselves, what is it that's intrinsically fascinating and effective about these practices, and how can it be scaled up? So, 
we, I know you can't see that from the back, this is to give you a sense merely that we travel to every continent. And in our selection criteria for the projects which we chose, we wanted to go for, firstly, projects which um, offered learning to people from age four to age 95. I have already been asked today, why did we stop at 95? That, <laughs> but I'll pass over that. Um, from a wide variety of trainers so or, or educators, such as in Finland, which is entirely state organized and state funded, as Mervy will explain, to non-government organizations, to corporate universities, to companies, every form of provider we covered. We wanted to cover all kinds of different levels of learning for work. So it goes up right to postgraduate level and also in primary schools, thinking about what kind of learning in schools is appropriate to enable people to start to be effective. And fundamentally, though, of course, we were looking for projects which are also effective and successful. How did, we dis how did we judge that? We were looking for projects which had evidence that as a result of their work, Young people and older people were capable more effectively to participate in markets, whether they are uh, a market economy, a social economy, a political economy. So truly participating in civic society and earning and learning a living. Um, there are some of the project holders, um, some of them amongst you. I want to thank them most sincerely for their um, gracious acceptance of our predating upon their time and their hospitality. Uh, they were generous in the extreme and we, we can't thank them enough. I'm sure they were delighted to see the back of us, although we did have some fasc fascinating conversations with them. Um, I'm going to pass over this very quickly. With this sophisticated audience, I don't think I need to say how quickly um, global knowledge economies have shifted such that workers need a very different set of skill sets. They need to learn to change those skill sets very quickly format hack teams, what's called swarming, ex, uh, distributing trust, growing trust very swiftly with people they don't know very well, have global competencies so that they can overcome the barriers of, of language and culture very swiftly and establish trust and be flexible and adapted to any time learning. Obviously, they need to be flexible um, and fluent in digital technologies. And they need, though, also to be capable of exerting leadership skills in different kinds of contexts. The danger of the homogenized, technologically globalized world, you might say, is apparent, that everything becomes a, a mishmash uh, and we wow. lose that sense of identity and specificity of our cultures. We found that our innovators felt very strongly that it's in our hands how we handle all of this. It is in the control of our own destinies. So I've swiftly moved over one of the drivers which is changing the world of work, that is to say technological and globalization sets of changes. The second is a set of changes around the environment. And this, I think, is one of Reza's photographs as you flew into La Bastilla in Nicaragua, as I recall. I've placed it here simply because when we think about the environment, we sometimes don't appreciate the degree to which it is changing the, need, the demands for the labour force. So because of droughts in sub-Saharan Africa, because of uh, floods in Bangladesh, India, some areas of the economy are simply unsustainable. Forestry, agriculture, insurance are industries which are starting to become unsustainable in certain parts of the world, whereas others, according to the International Energy Association, are starting to grow. So we see new gr jobs growing in, in green industries. For every billion dollars invested, apparently, that's 30,000 new jobs. So we see changing contours of economies in different parts of the world. And again, therefore, a need for a very swift adaptation and agility on the part of the workforce to keep up with that. Economies in flux it hardly needs uh, an introduction from me, but there are some clear losers as a result of our swiftly moving economies. The first is young people. Uh, last month, on the 16th of October, UNESCO published their latest e uh, economic report on the labour market for young people called Putting Education to Work. And in that, they report that one out of every eight young people is unemployed. And one out of every four is trapped in low skill, low pay, actually poverty style employment. So young people are the first losers. The low skilled, if you go to Andreas Schleicher's 
presentation later in the week, you will learn how it is that low schools are getting completely squeezed out of this uh, set of economies in flux. Security and stability. Uh, I think, again, the ILO has expressed considerable concerns about the fact that the kind of uh, security which we look to looked for from uh, employment has more or less disappeared and we're seeing in many parts of the world the phenomenon of per perma temps that is the moving from one uh, temporary job to another and of course the new phenomenon of rising graduate unemployment what has been known now as the the, the graduate without a future at the extremes, you see 50% unemployment of graduates in Spain, but right across the world, this is to be seen also. In China, there are now 6.6 .6 million people graduating with a first level degree each year. That's more than six times what it was <clears throat> about 10 years ago. And for the most part, we see economies actually unable to generate the level of GDP which can establish working patterns which will generate high level employment for these people. So, this pattern is one of flux, of swift change, but not at all without hope. Again, if, you'd went, if you had gone to the workshop earlier on the um, education and the needs of the workforce, this was a particular focus, the mismatch between the jobs that are available and the skills that are, are needed to match them. So uh, according to a report from McKinsey Global, in 2020 we will see 95 million surplus workers with low skills or uh, manual skills, but a, a, a shortage of 40 million people with higher level, at least graduate level skills uh, for the jobs which need them. How can we bridge this gap? I'm going to pause here to say that doing this book um, had a profound effect upon me and it had a profound effect upon my team. Mm -hmm. Because in talking to learners worldwide, again and again, the message we were hearing was the, the message which is embedded in this slide. And that is that the education system for the most part, is a part of the problem and not a part of the solution. And that is a very shocking finding. And it's why I prefaced my remarks today by saying that the work around this whole piece of how we educate people to learn a living has significant implications for how we organise learning in totality. Uh, Mr Paul Giniers is here, I think, and I'm quoting you. Um, there are good skills in entrepreneurship in Burkina Faso, which is where one of our projects was based, but they have to be relearned because school eliminates these skills. And again and again, we come across examples where schooling, as it were, removes from young people the creativity and the imagination and the, the, the natural capacity to learn, which we see in human animals. So let me introduce straight away my um, as it were, organiser for what we found. And we want to argue to you that learning a living is more than simply ensuring that people acquire skills and that they match them to the needs in the job market that are to be found. It's much more than that. It's essentially that, that's the foundation, but we argue there's more. So, the foundational piece is acquiring, matching and updating skills. The second piece, though, is around generating solutions. You might call that problem solving, but it's fundamentally about generating the solutions which confront us in the world today. And uh, when you think about the kind of uh, employment opportunities that are available and what almost every CEO of big organisations will tell you, those are the kinds of people that they need. But there's a step beyond that. And our innovators were supremely gifted in thinking about how young people certainly acquire the skills that are needed now and might be needed in the future. Certainly how to think about generating solutions to complex problems. But also in scanning the world, particularly in terms of people's authentic life experience and thinking about creative possibilities about how our world could change for the better. And that sounds grandiose, but that is nothing less than what we found. So let me give you some examples. I'm going to start with Finland, where, if you see in the logo, we're thinking here about the acquisition of skills. Um, the project which uh, uh, Mervi will talk about is based in Omnia, a very large three-city organisation for the um, training in vocational education, but how much more they do. And we chose it because, firstly, Finland is a system where if you go into so-called vocational education and training, it is not a dead end. It is absolutely a flexible system. And here's a remarkable fact. So far as it 
away from being an option for losers that more young people in Finland now choose at 16 to take the so-called vocational route than do the academic route. I talked to uh, Mervi's boss, the um, mayor, deputy mayor for education in Espoo in Finland, and he said, I get people ringing me up now, middle-class parents, well-off parents, having, saying, why on earth can't my kid get into this course? In the old days, they didn't want to know. Now, they see it as a really, really attractive option. Why? Because there's flexibility, because the courses lead to accreditation which is very highly re regarded by all employers. But at 18, they've lost nothing. They can still matriculate and go into universities. We chose Omnia because of their fantastically innovative approach, both to pedagogy within the sector. So here you see teachers at an edutech boot camp um, updating their skills to use iPod touches, iPads, cloud services, gamification, all in the service of project-based learning. It is ad, an, as, as an advanced form of 21st century pedagogy as you will find anywhere. And Omnia is very intent upon updating and innovating their approach to apprenticeship. One of the oldest forms of training for work, but one which still attracts too little support from employers. So that's the second reason. But thirdly, as we'll come to later, you know Omnia, which is um, Mervi's uh, division, they're, they're called, they call them the pro propeller heads, the people who innovate everything in sight. And they are looking very hard about how entrepreneurship is brought right inside the training program of the college. Um, this is Infosys, and we have a colleague from Infosys here, I think, welcome. Um, one of the largest corporate universities in the world, um, supremely skilled at enabling its graduate students, of whom there are now something like 20,000 a year, 20,000 a year, to embark upon a program of work which is both highly structured um, and research-based, evidence-based, but still, and this is what attracted us, gives an enormous amount of ownership to the learners. So the learners are not spoon-fed, are profoundly independent, but who navigate their way through uh, an extremely highly structured and uh, very effective curriculum um, in inf it, well, software engineers, but you want them to be the whole package, the, the whole package of business managers too. Um, I think this example is one of a new form of provider which is extremely interesting to us. But here's another point coming on to something I want to say right at the end. Infosys is an extraordinarily interesting example of an organisation which imbues values in its workforce right from the beginning. Everyone we spoke to there was so proud of working for this organisation, which from the outset made it clear it would not take bribes. And it was about not just a better company, but a better India and eventually a better world. My second uh, set of uh, ambitions from our organisation was around generating solutions, enabling people of all ages to look at problems as a good thing, to look at them as a space for learning from the earliest possible age. And here we quote the head teacher of Lumiar School in Sao Paulo in Brazil, uh, which is part of the set of schools established by Rudolf, uh, Rudolf Semler from Semco, a businessman. So we have a provider here from business who started to f have real problems filling the opportunities he had in Brazil in his companies. And he traced it back right down to the supply side and said, what are we doing at primary education level to enable young people to think about problems positively and to embrace them? And as you can see, that is exactly what they do at Lumiar. These kids, by the way, are designing a, sl a swing. They're not larking about. Move quickly on. This uh, project is a uh, rising sun energy project, and Jodie Pincus is somewhere here, I think, at the back. Hi, welcome. Uh, Jodie is chief executive of this fantastic organisation on the West Coast, which enables young people, largely Hispanic and African American young people, uh, with very few opportunities, to train and acquire the capacity to work in um, green energy, to go into domestic houses and enable householders to retrofit and think about their energy consumption and to reframe how they think about the whole issue of global warming. These young people spoke to us most movingly about the kinds of opportunities that Rising Sun gave them, not just to acquire skills and move into the economy, an economy which, by the way, is booming, but also to start to see the problems of their own lives and the problems of their communities in very different ways. 
I'm saying this in such an abbreviated form, I fear I'm hardly doing it justice. I know I'm not doing it justice. But I hope that you'll take the trouble to read that case study in the book, because it's one which it deeply inspired us. Um, this is the Southern University of Science and Technology in China, a newly established university. And Professor Zhu is here somewhere, I believe, at the back. Yes, welcome. Um, it has been established very much in opposition to the conventional form of higher education in China, which, as you will all know, I am sure, has for many years uh, been, let us say, more focused on the consumption of knowledge and the reproduction of it, rather than enabling students to think independently and to be creative. And that is what the Chinese economy needs. So this new... I've got five minutes left. Thank you for warning me. This new university is attempting to bring a very different approach to Chinese higher education, multidisciplinary, um, very much based in real world learning. All the students have real world projects um, and we will see if it survives in the Chinese context. We give it our full support and we hope innovations like that survive and thrive. I'm going to move on very quickly, but I just want to say one thing more about the school level system. This project, which is in our final quadrant, if you like, or our final space of creating possibilities, is the Big Picture Learning Company, which has 50 schools in the US, a number of in, Aust in Australia, and others worldwide. And it is a model which we think has profound implications for seeding learning a living at the school level. So young people in the Big Picture Learning Company spend two days of every week of their five days, not in the schoolhouse, in the classroom, but in internships, in a wide variety of uh, programs and companies and endeavors right across the community, from the public service, to the military, to TV and radio, to arts organizations, two days out of every five. And they have recently established, as part of their internship program, a center for innovation and entrepreneurship. And there's Dennis Litsky's quote, which stuck in my mind for so long subsequently. When young people are given real world experience and their learning is grounded in it, they change. They do change. And by engaging them and respecting them, you will change them and they become transformed. They become transformed in the sense of having a sense of self-efficacy, not just to become entrepreneurs and doing startups. This whole notion about entrepreneurship is not about start necessarily starting small businesses. It's about a mindset which enables young people to believe that they have self-efficacy and that they can affect both their own lives and the world around them. And that brings me to the final piece, um, which is around values, because I haven't quite finished with our model yet. This is a set of the faces which Reza has so extraordinarily captured from the Widows Alliance Network in Ghana. And any of you who know anything about Ghanaian society may perhaps know that in Ghana, um, widows are held responsible for the death of their husband. And they are more or less um, deprived of any assets that they hold and are not allowed to work. And Mama Zinzi, is she here? She, I know she's in the building somewhere, um, who's a bit like the Ghanaian opera, uh, saw this phenomenon and said this cannot stand. And she's created the Widows' Alliance, which is about education opportunities and training, certainly. But before you get there, there's an issue about how people value themselves. And what she does, what the network does with widows, is to move, first of all, into enabling them to rethink their place in the world and the value they place on their own life. And it's from that base that they can then move into acquiring skills and thinking, yes, about how they generate some solutions to problems, probably through microfinance or a whole range of other opportunities which the network provides. Um, there she is with some of the people in the Alliance. So where I want to leave you, really, and, and bring in my colleagues is the final part of our thinking, which was around, yes, you need skills to be acquired and matched and updated, but they need to be embedded in values. Yes, you need to be enabled to generate solutions to complex problems, but which problems you choose and the kind of solutions, again, need to be embedded profoundly in values, as did creating possibilities. And as you move across that spectrum, what we observe is a shift from simply consuming knowledge, actually to being producers of knowledge, to moving from consumption of knowledge to the production of a better world.
And that is why I particularly asked Mrs. Arsafak to come today, because here is a shot from her work in uh, Kuwait, where, to be truthful, many young people in Kuwait do not have to work. The um, revenues flowing from the economy are such that they don't have the incentive to find a job in order to live. What does this create? A problem where young people, from the most part, lack purpose, lack a sense of uh, place in the world. And what LOIAC does, yes, with internships and many of the other kinds of uh, techniques that we saw our projects bring about, is to enable those young people to be in circumstances where they started to see their own work in relation to the future of the country quite differently. In other words, before they can even move to the point of caring about acquiring the right skills, or caring about how they might think about solving the problems of their country, they need to see that they can make a difference to it, and that's exactly what LOIAC does. Finally, um, to IE in Burkina Faso, and we must say again how very inspired we were by your work, the, pro the students within that project said to us again and again, not, I want to be a multimillionaire, but I want to make a different Africa. So, these faces, I keep saying finally, but this really is finally, the last project I'm uh, able to mention today, are from our, our project in Japan. This is the Silver Human Resources Centre. And the Silver Human Resources Centre enables learners up to 95, I guess older if they choose to, after they have so-called retired, to move into programmes which enable them to update their skills, to offer community service, and to give a level of reciprocity in their communities based on the values that they have acquired through working collaboratively together. So those are the projects which, in such a brief uh, roundup, I, I, I know I have not served well. Forgive me, I've done my best. What I want to say in ending is that this issue is not one about vocational education and training. It's one about how we organise learning. It's one about the focus of schooling. And unless we change that, and we know how to, because we've got some great examples across the world, we know how to do it. Unless we, re -shift, we, we, we shift and refocus how we organise learning in schools, we will continue to have this divide with vocational education, which in my view is deeply damaging to the future of our society and to us as individuals. So thank you for listening to me. I want to pass now to Reza, who, as I know, I'm, I'm coming to you next, Reza, because you had a, a, a quick view of the whole, so you're five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. I was uh, saying that the, 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 the ladies first, uh, so going to them. The, the, uh, actually, uh, uh, you want to stand? OK. <laughs> um, uh, probably some of you, you don't know my works. I'm a photographer, usually working for National Geographic magazine. And in the past 30 years, most of my time was in the war zones, conflict, uh, in uh, places which really there was a social changings and uh, uh, tough places. Uh, really, that's uh, actually uh, one of Part of my works is exhibited in the near the Sheraton Park and outdoor in the Cornish. It is going to two tiers of my works, and uh, uh, in the meantime, what I have seen all in, in all those part of the world has brought me to create my own NGO, which is uh, working in Afghanistan, in Uganda, in refugee camps, in the suburbs of the Europe, trainings women to the media trainings, uh, getting the education for the children. So somehow between a photographer in a level of National Geographic or documentary makings for them and as someone that has an ideas of the education, that has a, himself has created an NGO and using image, which is a f language, universal language for the uh, education, I was still moving between the two of them. I take pictures got money, go back to give to the, to the kids in Afghanistan, and that, that's what I'm doing, that's how I works. So comes suddenly this story of the Wise Book, when the Foundation Wise Book uh, and uh, publisher Bloomsbury uh, in uh, London, they contact me saying that they have this idea of making this book, and uh, if I do it, and it was, for me, 
to tell you the truth, it was a real gift. Because I was going to meet uh, not the same kind of the people that I always use, used to meet, which are on the war zones, on the, the wha what we call it, the heroes in front of the window. Like spending time with the Ahmad Shah Massoud in Afghanistan or Arafat or many other people. Well, I have seen the people which somehow they are heroes in a different way. Then I was going for 15 of them, meetings those silent heroes of the humanity. And those people which, <coughs> which I met, which I am, as uh, Valerie told, I have this privilege of being in the whole team, the only one that has gone to one to others, having my own vision of the, as a photographer, as a, uh, uh, experience of a photographer, but also experience of the NGOs, and then seeing one by one as uh, the best title which I can give to you is the, are the silent heroes of the humanity, because that's how the 21st century is going to change. That's how we are going somehow, little by little, overcome these ideas of the wars and the conflicts and famines and everything that is a player for the humanity. The, the main things that will bring down all those things is education. And it doesn't matter if this education is done in a kindergarten in Sao Paulo or in university in Africa or in uh, streets of the India or uh, in the one of the most unbelievable company, which is Infosys or in Bangladesh. I mean, each of you, what you are doing, it is you are building the 21st century. The, the, the key is the education. There is no other thing that we could use on it. And that's how I believe on it. The, uh, uh, this is also coming, you know, we, we all know, we learn all those things when we are children. You, we became who we are, we're standing. If you look back, everything's come up between age of the 10, 12, 13. That's how it became, all of us. And I do remember being a kid in Iran, my native country, uh, learnings in the school books, the first books that we got, the learning alphabets. It was not going to alphabet. It was starting immediately with the histories, with the stories, with the poetries. That's how we were learning. And this is, this is the story which I remember. That story that we all doing it. The story which I always remember and it's engraved here because I was seven years old when I read it, was there was a day a very old farmer, 95 years plus, was planting a walnut tree. And three young, very young, passing through in the village, he starts saying to him, hey, old man, the walnut trees need 25 years to give fruits. You will be die. Why you are giving such a pain for you? And his answer is actually, I think that, for all of us, is what we are doing. He looks back to them and he said, you know, my son, all the walnuts that I have eaten all my life, the trees was planted with someone else before me. That's why. On that note. <laughs> I'm planting this seed for you. Thank you very much, the silent heroes of humanity. Thank you very much. Mervy, I wonder if I could pass to you and invite you to say something about the thinking behind the work and your own contribution. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So my name is Mervy Janssen. I'm the head of Learning Solutions in Omnia, and um, I have an interesting task. Um, in Finland, all education virtually is public. So we are, if you want, um, creating radical innovation in the public sector. That so some people can say that's impossible, and um, I'm not saying it's an easy task, but it's a very interesting task. And um, participating, being chosen 
in this project has given us a great opportunity to look ourselves in the mirror and also look at what we've accomplished but also what is yet to be accomplished because I agree with Valerie that this is just the beginning. If we want radical change, we need to do things differently. But what is differently is the question here. So looking at the book, I was very happy to get a copy last night and being able to do a quick read. I think the um, cases there are very inspirational. Um, overall, if I look at what we have done differently, what has changed and what the book is about, again, looking at working life and education not as separate things, but on how we can bring to these together to mix and match. And um, we, for instance, decided in In Omnia that we didn't want to have to go out for working life, we want to bring working life in. So we opened our doors to entrepreneurs and we have people starting their business, working on a day-to-day -day basis with our students and our teachers. And we think that's very important. For one, they get cheap office space and workspace, which they need to when they start their business, but we also get the interaction, the role models. Because without the role models, without the inspiration, if we close our kids and our youth inside classrooms and say, the real life is out there, where is the real learning? Who are we educating these people for? It's for working life. And we should not separate academia and working life and vocational as separate streams. And who are we to say who is going to need thinking skills we all need thinking skills. If you look at somebody who's graduating for the next 50 years, can we honestly say that it's enough that you know how to do welding or you know how to be a good cook? We actually do all need those thinking skills. So we need to have systems where that is in built in the system. So it's in the curriculum, it's in our pedagogy, it's in how we teach. Which brings me to teacher training. Because a lot of our teachers teach the way they were taught themselves. And we need to break that. We can say it's a good cycle, but in my opinion, it's also a vicious cycle. Because if we are not doing things differently, how can we tell the youth, go out there and be radical and be innovative, when we're teaching them exactly in the opposite manner? And I think this is very important because um, we have been looking at teacher training and I think that's a next thing, a very important thing to look at. And not teacher training so that the teachers are isolated. In the training we've done, we've actually taken our learners to be some of the guides, learning guides to the teachers, to the principals. So mix and match. And also with the, together with our entrepreneurs. So I think we need new models for this. If we're not going to just cram and spoon feed our youth with whether it's knowledge or skills, that will never be enough if we want them to create new solutions. Where are the tools to do this? Where is the out-of-box thinking? Um, one thing I always say in Finland, um, because everybody knows us for the good PISA results, that's very fine, but as Valerie said, after PISA, 52% nowadays of our youth actually choose the vocational route. Um, I like to think that the one reason for that is because we have less of the workbooks to fill in the blanks and tick the boxes. So it's about doing things in real life. And it's about learning, really learning for a living and a better living. So this is something that we will need to work on for the future. It's not finished, thank God, otherwise it would be really boring. But um, I think it's something that we can work together as networks. And um, what we have here in the book, that's the beginning of a great network. So I definitely hope that we will participate in that work also in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I'm sure that um, that high-level speedy tour across some of the projects was not exactly what you expected if you were coming to a, um, a session on training the workforce with its, the, the, the narrow dimensions that that was likely to have. But you'll have had a sense, I think, of the kind of scope of the book which we have, which we have tried to create, which we truly believe is a contribution to the debate about how we all, as a, as a human race, really, learn our living in the future, and about how learning is organised. So despite the fact that we started late, um, we tried to leave some time for questions from you or observations from you. I'm Franny Leotier from the African Capacity Building Foundation, and I'd first like to congratulate you for an excellent way of combining learning from images and learning from text, and uh, it's, b it's a beautiful book, so congratulations. My question is on uh, the lessons that you found. When you look at um, uh, 
say, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, going to school was a small part of life. Today, because we've added many more years of schooling, going to school is a big part of life. In the lessons that you have uh, found in your research, where do you see the balance now between those who end up with few years of schooling versus those who end up with many years of schooling in how they live? Because the, your book is about learning to live. So I'd be interested in your perspective on that. Thank you. I have obviously huge um, support and sympathy for the Millennium Development Goals, which wants to see all young people in primary schools. But at the same time, paradoxically, I'm really concerned about our being schooled um, and incarcerating young people in places away from the real world, which is why, had I longer, I would have been talking a little bit more about the projects in our work, which show how schooling does not need to do that. And that we need, in my view, to um, dissolve some of the barriers between school and real life. That we need to dissolve this notion that everything that matters in learning happens in a classroom. On the contrary, we know that young people's learning is far from bounded within the classroom and that much of their important learning happens elsewhere. And in our view, the best innovators and the most powerful innovators are, co are creating models now where they combine conceptual, coherent systematizing of learning with a, a, a teacher who both mentors, facilitates and guides, and yes, sometimes instructs, with experience in real life endeavors which matter to their communities and which the young people feel that they are valued. And they bring that learning back into a space where they can make sense of it. And for me, that's the vision for learning going forward. And in such a vision, we would not see, as Mervy has already said, this sharp division between the so-called academic and the vocational, which is so very, very damaging. We would see this intertwined in ways which would, I believe, benefit us all. So schooling is our enemy and it's our friend. It's a very complex position. Please, more questions. Who can? I'm Antalaq al-Mutawakkil in Arabic, Antalaq al-Mutawakkil from Yemen, from Youth Leadership Development Foundation. Uh, which you really established in 1998, uh, focused on uh, empowerment and giving uh, education, informal education to, uh, young, uh, to young people, especially in leadership and vocational training, and those also skills that have been really missed by the public uh, schools. Uh, my question is, uh, gender equality and equity is really a challenge either in the vocational training, formal training, and also in the job opportunities. Uh, and the gap is still really uh, big and maybe smaller in, in, in some countries, but it's still there. I wonder of those initiatives, if you have faced uh, this challenge of the gender gap, and what are the procedures that you have really used to close that uh, gender gap? Thank you. Uh, yeah, gender gap, I mean here, here I, we, we come to the, the girls, okay? Uh, there is no gender equity or equality. The number of girls either in education or in job opportunities is still much, much less. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go to the schooling, the number of girls who really miss education is still big, bigger than the boys. Uh, in job opportunities, the same. In vocational training, if I'm talking about my experience in Yemen, we, uh, girls are still miss, missed in the vocational training. No, uh, no space for girls actually, or it's not accepted culturally and by social, <coughs> also by society, uh, for girls to join vocational training or leadership trainings or whatever. I mean, that's what I mean by gender gap or gender equity and equality. Between, between between the two genders, genders the yeah. two genders uh, the two sexes yes girls uh, and, uh, and uh, well uh, well in our uh, case it's the, what we offer in loyak is for co-education it's uh, it's available for both of them and uh, equal for both of them uh, actually you don't we don't feel this much in kuwait uh, so uh, both uh, boys and girls are offered the same, uh, you know, opportunity in education and in vo vocational training. And uh, actually, to the contrary, the girls are joy. Uh, number of girls pre precede boys in Kuwait, yani, as a popu population. 
so uh, to the contrary, they have to raise the percentage, for example, uh, to allow boys to enter. They will uh, hire, <laughs> yes, <laughs> engineering, for example, College Faculty of Engineering in Kuwait. Uh, they raise the uh, percentage for acceptance for uh, for the girls so that she has to earn, for example, 98% to enter College of Engineering, while the boys will enter at 92%, for example. <laughs> Hadi, this is, this is an example because the number of girls precedes boys, because the number of girls in engineering is much higher. In general, the number of girls in the country, because in all colleges, Yani are much higher than the boys. But we don't have I'm this, to, we don't to, uh, feel it. I'm going to leave you, you colleagues <laughs> to sort that one out. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. a female Please community, go. actually. It's a female community. I to answer your question. <laughs> we, uh, we had the same problem in Bangladesh, <laughs> where there, there, were, oh. there were more, ch more girl children um, are left out of schools in Bangladesh. So what I, when I started my school system, we now have 38,000 schools. We, when I, we went to a village and we said that we want 70% of the children must be girls. And then the village said, that, no, 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 take half, half, half boys, half. So we said, no, we won't even start a school in this village unless you produce 70% girls. So that's how we started. And over the next 30 years, Bangladesh has more girls in primary schools today than boys. Mm -hmm. So one has to really insist on girls going to school or parents preferring to, or at least uh, allowing the girls' children to go, go to school. So ultimately it will come uh, to equality of some kind. <laughs> so in Bangladesh what happened is that <laughs> we now have more girls in primary schools than boys. Thank you. Wow. So it can be done. Um, it can be done. Very quickly. So thank you. Who you are? Uh, my name is Kofi. That's the simplest. Uh, I come from Ghana. Um, would my panelists agree with me that really the upheavals we are having around the world, workplace, is actually a delayed, don't know how to put it. Uh, you know, when we're telling from 20th century, 21st century, all the geeks we are worried about, a computer shutdown, stuff like that. It really didn't happen. Would you agree with him that what is happening now is probably a delayed effect, the need for us to retool and think differently. I've been in the university system for 32 years, and I'm learning from my students all the time. I am barely literate in computing, but as I learn from them in all things, I, I notice that my, my learning power and my innovation, my ability to lead them uh, gets better. Is it the case that maybe there's some light ahead of us, that after my generation has gone, a new generation who understand the innovative things that you are talking about will really take over? Because it's like setting up a system where the managers don't understand what they are doing. And those under them really understand more, but we hold the sway of power. I just want to throw this out there. Thank you. We welcome that. And final question from the back here. First of all, I, I'm Subraya, uh, Infosys, India. First of all, congratulations for coming out with a wonderful book. Uh, when you're looking at the, all the projects, uh, all these projects are mutually very exclusive. But at the same time, it looks like that after going through all the project, through the book, probably it's collectively exhaustive. Uh, <coughs> what are the top three things that as a reader, we have to carry out in carrying out our learning business. In a sense, from the kindergartens to the, at the top level, if you wanted to enable, after going through these projects, what are the top three things I can take it as a best practices to enable the you know, folks at different levels? Thank you for that challenge. I'll think about it while we take the final question at the back here. Hi, uh, my name's Nick Kafka from Teach Man to Fish, and thanks for including our Lab Astia project uh, in the book. So uh, I didn't get a chance to profile it today. It's a wonderful book. <laughs> <question. laughs> and I'm looking forward to reading the book. Uh, I mean, I guess one of the challenges we really had there is lots of fights at the start with the government. So, uh, and loving what's happening in Finland, which is our sort of ideal country. But so the two questions, you know, 
One, did you find any other examples of governments who really were opening up opportunities for innovation? And secondly, the big one, you know, how do we move for the countries where governments aren't so open to innovation to a stage where we're able, we're not just operating on the fringes with our great little projects and we're actually able to mainstream some of this stuff? Thank you for those. In view of the shortness of time, colleagues, may I begin the answers to these? And if you want to chime in at the end, then feel free to do so, please. Kofi, to your question, I absolutely agree with you. And in talking to the learners who we met, and we met many hundreds, I would guess, um, we did come away with a sense of optimism because the changes in this 21st century have given young people the access to learning such that they don't need the intermediation anymore of these organisations which for so long have actually, as, as Paul from 2IE remarked, drained them of their capacity to learn and be effective. So there is a sense in which um, the audience is taking to the stage and the young people are gaining the tools for themselves. And that gives me great hope, because amongst them we find idealism which puts us to shame. And the reason why our book ends with values was that so many of these young people were starting to see the world you know, we worry about globalisation. They don't worry about globalisation. They, well, for all its malcontents and all its downsides, they see themselves as part of a, a bigger family of humanity. And they don't give you the narrative of our economy's got to grow faster than that economy in case they steal our jobs. They're not interested in that narrative. They're interested in a very different narrative. For a start, making sure the planet survives. And so, if you really move to the learners and think about their preconception or their, their, their preoccupations, it does give you great hope. And that brings me to the three points, I think. Um, from thinking about these projects, what, what did they have in common? One was this, as you do so much in Infosys, you put the learner in the position where they own their learning and where they are empowered to organize and um, create the learning journey. Uh, assisted by, and paradoxically by the kind of very research and evidence-based structuring that you carry out. But fundamentally, turning it over to them, that's absolutely the first thing. Secondly, I think that um, those who enable digital technologies to create new forms of collaboration give those young people an incredibly accelerated start. And if they can do that, then they're, they're putting into a, a whole new game. I'm not quite sure what the third one would be. I think probably thinking big and having Sir Fazli Abad here with us is, is something which perhaps inspires me to say this, which was that most of the projects we looked at, they didn't get into our scan unless they were either scaling already or really had the potential to, to scale and had it in their sights. And every one of the people I've spoken to said, you know, I, I remember your, your fury about how slow it was for you to sort of move to the sort of scale that you wanted to. But this woman is thinking kind of global. She's not thinking just about Kuwait. And none of our other projects were. And I think that that notion of don't just think about your institution, she is determined to change the way teachers are trained in Finland. It's not r remotely just con content with what's been achieved at Omnia, but it's got much bigger um, ambitions. So I think that notion about thinking globally is, is really significant. And to your final question, um, which is other countries. Well, there are, there are sparks. I mean, I mentioned Japan, which uh, with, with foresight has created, and it's completely government supported, and it is an aging society, of course, uh, um, immensely aging. But um, they have seen that lifelong learning has got to be made a reality, and they've put funding into it, and they've made it an entitlement for older people both to contribute and to take back, to update their skills, to share their skills. So that kind of thing, I think, is fantastic. And so too is South Korea. So Cor South Korea has created lifelong learning cities and lifelong learning banks. And if you Google all that stuff, you will very quickly come up with a, a society which certainly um, elevates education to you know, a, very, a very high place, but doesn't think it stops with formal learning, has a, has a very ambitious and generous vision, I think. And if you're in a place where that's not the case, you were asking me, what should you do? Um, Go it alone, form an NGO, link up with the great successes in this field. And you'll see at the end of our book a whole series of kind of proposals or suggestions for people in that position. Um, and we, we thought very carefully about the way in which these organisations have grown in unpropitious circumstances. And we put forward a, a, a few helpful rules. Um, one of them is to achieve blends of resourcing and self-sufficiency from very early on. And you know, there are some good models as to how to do that, not to be too dependent on a single resourcing source. But I suspect you've got a lot to teach us on that as well. 
Um, unless anyone, Riza, last word, no, we're done. It's nearly quarter past two, and I'm so grateful to you for hanging in with us, though we've overrun your time. Um, I hope you enjoyed today. I hope you enjoyed thinking about the work, and um, thank you once more for coming. Thank you.